Uh, I'd like to introduce Todd Sacerdoti. I met Todd because our children go to preschool together, which is, uh, you know, as good a reason as any to get him up here. Um, so, uh, Todd, come on up. Hello, hello. Can you guys hear me? Cool. Uh, so my name is Todd Sacerdotti, um, and I was the founder and CEO of Brightroll. Just a real quick show of hands, how many people know or have heard of Brightroll and what we do? Okay, so real quick, we were a video advertising uh, company, originally really an ad network business, and eventually became a software platform for the video ad industry. Uh, I founded the company in 2006, and we sold the company in December of 2014 for $640 million to Yahoo, and I, I'm actually still at Yahoo, um, and I have a three-year uh, arrangement with Yahoo. Um, and about a year and a half into my tenure there, they actually asked me to give a, a talk sort of about the Bright Roll story, um, and that was really the sort of founding of this talk. Uh, Nathan saw my blog post on it and, and sort of asked me to share it. And when I put it together, I think, you know, I thought about what are all the lessons learned from running a startup and having a great exit and doing it for roughly a decade. But I think really, like, startup successes and lessons learned, they've just really been well documented by so many people. And so I wanted to focus um, really my talk on sort of what were the non-obvious lessons learned. And in many ways, this talk is really about which rules can you break and sort of how do you know when to break them as much as it is about startup best practices um, in general. So just a little bit about the company. So this is our revenue trajectory over the nine years um, that I was running the company. Um, and there are a lot of things that I think if you talk to an investor employee or someone that, you know, after an exit happens and everything will be kind of linear and rosy, you know, it'd be like an angel investor in the company returned 55 times their money or we got to a couple hundred million plus in revenue or four years of profitability and they'll kind of list off the economic successes. Um, but I think if you're inside the company, I think that the things that I, stand out to me are really the career growth and overcoming the challenges and seeing a bunch of people, uh, you know, sort of succeed together. Uh, and the real brutal truth, I think, is that there, there's this quote uh, that I love, which is from Mike Tyson, which is, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And I think we got punched in the face a lot, and I think what's underneath this story is kind of all of those tough days, tough nights, hard decisions. And I hope that that really informs uh, these kind of non-obvious lessons. And I don't give these as advice because I didn't want advice when I was running my company, but I think of these as examples of rules being broken that worked for one company and, and sort of interpret you know, as, as, as it's relevant or not for you. Um, uh, so the first lesson learned is actually to overspend. Um, and I think the conventional wisdom in Silicon Valley is you know, be frugal in all you do. And so I'll give you a couple examples, really a couple examples in every one of these, but a couple examples of where we overspent, uh, at least from the perception of others, and it was really important. Um, so about six months into our, our sort of journey, we realized we needed to make a business model pivot and move from selling performance advertising to selling brand advertising. Uh, and for anyone who's ever sold advertising knows that to sell brand advertising, you need uh, a sort of a senior salesperson that has a strong you know, brand and reputation of their own in the industry, uh, generally highly compensated, very relationship driven. Um, and we needed to essentially find that person and we were a four person company, one product manager, three engineers, and none of us had sold anything. Um, and so I made the decision that we needed to massively over index to the most senior, most well respected uh, branded salesperson we could find. Um, and we ended up hiring a, a gentleman who at the time, ran the West Coast for a very large company which had just been acquired by AOL. Um, and we had raised about a million dollars of seed money of which we were about halfway through. And to kind of put this in context, I mean, this person was by far the highest paid individual in the company, um, you know, had a very significant equity grant in addition to meet, meeting their existing salary and bonus structure. And, you know, kind of back it out, more than half of the money we had in the bank would go to this individual over the first year of their employment. Um, and so it was very fair for people to say this was a crazy decision, you shouldn't do it, you're overspending. Um, but you know, for a fast forward eight years later, that individual is running a nearly 100 person uh, sales organization and we we're doing multi hundreds of millions of, of sales at that point. Uh, so it ended up being one of the most important hires uh, that we made. And it's kind of funny, he's actually walking out right here from a, a meeting in a conference room. So let's give Charlie Whittingham a round of applause. <laughs> A uh, very random turn of events that we both ended up here tonight, but um, uh, one of our very important hires. 
Um, similarly, um, I get a question, I meet entrepreneurs all the time and I always ask them, I say, what's most important to you right now? And I almost always hear them say, we need to hire people. We need to hire great people. We need to hire engineers. You know, it's generally a, a people-related answer. It's about half the time that's the number one thing. And I always ask them, so how much do you pay your head of talent acquisition? And I get like the funniest answers. I get this, well, you know, we don't really have a head or, you know, we have a, you know, the sister of the co-founder or the brother of some guy who works here is kind of doing it on a contract basis and we only pay on performance. And, you know, it's always these like hacky answers. Um, but I never hear if someone says, can you fix that? Um, somebody says, you know, we're revenue focused. And then I say, how much do you pay your head of sales? And of course, they're like very proud of, you know, having a, a well compensated head of sales. Um, and so we hired in about 2011 a head of talent acquisition um, that was one of the highest paid employees in the company. It was really a bet the company decision on this individual because we had essentially stopped hiring engineers. We had actually been net negative over a six month period. Um, and I found an individual who I thought was a unicorn, uh, I thought would change the trajectory of a hiring process, uh, a huge reach uh, for this individual. Uh, but about six months later, it went from being a competitive weakness to a competitive advantage uh, in terms of the organization and the processes that they built. So I have other stories of that, but I think the lesson is you can't overspend on great people when they're in a position to change the, tra change the trajectory uh, of your company. I think it's funny that Michael Jordan playing baseball has come up twice tonight. Um, but uh, lesson two is don't innovate. And, and I tell a story. My mom comes to my house every Sunday to, to hang out with my kids. And uh, you know she's been in the biotech industry for 30 years, and she always brings these kind of interesting challenges. You know, how do you think we should address uh, you know ageism in Silicon Valley, or we have this really naughty HR management problem and performance management? How do you think about dealing with this? And and you're an innovative company, you know, you should solve this. And over the years, I really just came to the assessment that if solving something that wasn't core to our differentiation spent like one minute of my time, it was a waste of time. Uh, and I'll give you a couple examples of this. So we ask, get asked a lot, you know, how did you come up with a Bright World brand? I went to GoDaddy, I did a search, I had four or five names, I emailed 10 people, I picked the one that had the highest vote, right? I found a logo, colors that I liked, I found another logo that I liked, I designed it in Photoshop and one evening and that, you know, that was our logo. Our marketing collateral was literally just find some B2B company that you like their marketing collateral, change the colors, change the logo, and just go with it. It's just there's so much time, I think, in these early stage companies where people are spending tremendous time innovating in things that have absolutely nothing to do uh, with their businesses. And I think the, the areas in which I'm even, I'm probably the most skeptical here is where sort of any process that touches people. So, you know, someone will say, um, we've got a new performance management system where we're going to rate people on a bi-weekly basis and then we're going to aggregate and then we're going to do, you know, school grades and it's really complex. It's like, first of all, it's probably worse than the best practice that's out there. And second of all, the amount of time you're spending is taking you away uh, from really core things you could do to be building your company and your differentiation. So when I reflect on our company, we, we went to people at Google who said, what's your quarterly review process? We copied it. I heard LinkedIn had a really good uh, all hands meeting. You know, I literally copied it down to the like template by the minute. And anytime you can find like just some set of best practices, um, you know, you just replicate it and move on. So if someone came to me and said, we have a, you know, an idea to build some software around recruiting engineers and it's identifying and, and contacting them, it's like maybe, because maybe that there's some opportunity to have an edge there and maybe it would change the traject to your company, but I'm definitely skeptical of that effort uh, initially, and my sort of strong bias would be don't innovate unless it's absolutely required uh, and core to your business. Um, so the third rule is, is be an asshole, and um, I think Silicon Valley has this standard kind of no assholes rule, um, and I'll give you sort of two examples where it was important for us to be an asshole. So one was um, early in our history, the, this is relatively nuanced to our business, but uh, the video ad unit in video advertising is a video ad before content. You've all seen it. You press play on a video and you have to wait 30 seconds and you curse Bright Roll and all the other companies that do it. But that's the video ad unit. And a bunch of companies had figured out, well, we can just take a display ad, you know, like a banner ad off to the right, and we can auto start a video player and play the 30 second ad and then play content after that. And the user won't care because it's kind of off, off to the side. Um, and we called this essentially fake pre-roll, because was, pre-roll was the ad unit, and this was like a fake way of doing it. It was about one-tenth the cost. And it was fundamentally hurting our business, because every time we would sell, you know, buyers would say, well, I'm getting this much cheaper from one of your competitors. Um, and so uh, actually, Charlie and I kind of went on this road show, and we showed it to all these ad agencies. You know, here's the people that are doing it. Here's the brands. Here's how it's done, you know, screenshots and links. 
And, and basically the assessment in the end was that they were complicit in the behavior because essentially they were being rewarded by their customers to get lower prices. Um, and their customers in many cases didn't understand what was happening. And so this was really critical you know, to our business. And so we decided what to do was we were gonna do a few things. First of all, we, we reached out to one of the big ad publications called Adweek and we wrote a byline. And in the byline, we explained everything that was happening. We named advertisers, we named agencies, we named uh, competitors. And then we did a corporate blog post with links to all the things and screenshots and much more detail. Um, and you could definitely argue this was a major asshole move. I mean, we not only called our competitors, we called out some of our customers, um, but we really needed to shed light on this. And, and we actually provided a list of 10 questions to ask any vendor in the industry that you're doing business with to figure out if you're participating in this. And you know, we started hearing these questions asked of our sales team in market, so we knew that we had you know, made an impact and moved the business forward. Uh, another example was uh, uh, the head of advertising for a big consumer products company called Reckitt, uh, sort of at the peak of the uh, financial crisis, decided to move $20 million into our category, which was a huge budget, and the catch was he was paying $3 for pre-roll uh, ads, which was about kind of one-fifth uh, of the going rate. Um, and so, of course, we said, even though it was probably a money losing or best case scenario break even proposition, we're like, yes, we will do it, no problem, you know, sign the IO, let's get running. Uh, and we called a bunch of our publishing partners who were a kind of CNN and Yahoo and ESPN at the time. Um, and of course, you know, this advertiser had also called them and they had all turned him down uh, when he had offered $3. Um, and I got two personal phone calls, one from Microsoft's, uh, I think, head of video and one from Hulu's head of sales. Uh, that basically directly said you did either a disservice to the industry or frankly, that was an asshole move to take that campaign. Uh, but fundamentally, this was disintermediation you know, at its core. We, we, we owned no inventory, we were a software platform. There was no risk to us taking this campaign. We ended up running it for about two to three years before we ended up firing the customer because it was unprofitable. Um, but it was a huge advantage for our business uh, and it was competitively challenging for them. So, the lesson here, I think, is, is be an asshole. It's generally within your industry, not within your company. Um, and I think you know, be strategic about the times that you sort of pull that card. Uh, so trivia question, why do uh, band tour managers ask for green M&Ms in the green room of a concert? Who knows? Yes? It's a, attention to detail, it's a test. Yeah, so I call it an edge case, but it's a, it's a signal. Uh, if there's green M&Ms in your waiting room, then the speakers are gonna work, the microphones will work. If there's not green M&Ms, you know, you know, sort of, you're concerned, right? Um, and I think because Silicon Valley is, is sort of so focused on the MV everything, you know, minimum viable hiring process, minimum viable company function, minimum viable product, we sort of forget about every edge case. I'm gonna give you two edge cases that were really material for us. So, our head of talent acquisition came to me about six months after we hired him and he said, I wanna reimagine the hiring process at Brightroll. I said, great, uh, hiring process is terrible, we really need to improve it. And he said, I'm gonna optimize the entire process around the rejected candidate. And I remember going, that sounds like a really bad idea. The, the rejected candidate costs us money, takes our time, gives us no value, why optimize for the rejected candidate? And what he said is, we touch a lot more rejected candidates than we do accepted candidates. And if you optimize the process for them, uh, what you'll be basically do is you'll fix the process for everybody. Um, and so the things we did were actually really simple. So uh, we talked to a bunch of rejected candidates, what they liked about the process, what they didn't, and we did some simple things. So our sort of talent acquisition person was in the lobby of our office waiting for the candidate when they walked in. We gave the person a personal tour. We never left them alone for more than five minutes. Uh, we had a two sort of very core values that we wanted to demonstrate in the hiring process, getting shit done and transparency. And so part of the interview process was an opportunity for them to demonstrate their ability to get stuff done. Um, and we were very transparent with them during the interview process. Here's how it's going, here's concern areas, here's some feedback we've gotten. Uh, if the interview was gonna end in a failure, we wouldn't continue the interview, we'd just let them know and, and have them leave. Um, and we actually hired, uh, about a, within the 12 months after doing this, we had three referrals from rejected candidates, which to me is such an incredible uh, metric. Uh, so if anyone ever tells me they're measuring the referral rate of their rejected candidates, I know that their hiring process will be tight. Um, another edge case that I'm now uh, very personally aware of is uh, remote offices. How many people here work in a remote office? How many people here have remote offices? Far, far more. It generally sucks to work in a remote office. And, 
Um, we had 11 offices around the world. Uh, and the edge case here is just make sure whatever corporate function you're running works well for a remote office. Like be remote office first. Because if it's good for the remote office, I guarantee you it's good for headquarters. Um, and people do the minimum viable company function, the minimum viable all hands, the video conferencing sucks, the minimum viable swag where anyone in a remote office doesn't get it, the minimum viable holiday party where you know, only if you're headquarters you go. So there's so many examples, just think of, of remote office first and I think you'll benefit from this lesson. Um, so some of the VCs in the room actually asked me to put this slide in and so this is just required. Um, no, I'm joking. Um, so uh, this lesson is really get a low valuation and um, I think there's some controversy, controversy to this and I think this doesn't necessarily apply to every case, uh, but it applied to us and I'll give you a, a couple examples. So. Before I started Bright Roll, I worked at a company called Plaxo, and Plaxo in many ways had the celebrity board. We had Mike Moritz from Sequoia, Ram Sharam, who's on the board of Google, Tim Kugel, who's the CEO of Yahoo. Uh, we had Ron Conway, who's one of the most famous angels, John Callahan, who ended up starting True Ventures. Um, it was really this amazing board, it was very large. Um, and you know, we spent about a week preparing for the board meeting, and about a week after the board meeting, uh, doing all the follow-ups. And this was all great, except for the fact that we met once a month. Um, and so essentially half the time in the company we were just managing and dealing with the board. So when I started Brightwell, I had a very simple heuristic. And this is somewhat in contrast to what Gil said earlier, which was, number one, I wanted a lead investor or the primary VC investor in future rounds that I knew personally. And if I didn't know them personally, it had to be somebody I knew somebody who knew them personally, but preferably I knew them personally. Um, second was that they had a low likelihood of screwing up the company. Um, and that was a kind of softer metric, but very important. And then the third was terms. And if you follow along those lines, you will by definition end up with a lower valuation because you have a far fewer set of people that you're reaching out to. Um, and, and secondly, there were two really critical times in our history, 2008 when we missed our numbers by about 50%. Uh, and if you do that a quarter that you're about to go out and fundraise, um, you know, I pity you in that process because it's brutal. Um, and we greatly benefited from having a low valuation. We ended up doing a bridge round which ended up being the best financial decision we made in the entire history of the company. Wouldn't have happened uh, if we had had a high valuation. Um, and of course, when we went to sell the company, we had an extremely clean to cap table. We had essentially no issues with getting to, we ended up getting a valuation probably would have worked even if we hadn't had had higher valuations, but um, it was important for us to have the option of exiting at a, at a more reasonable uh, and rational valuation. There were definitely times in our history where people raised three to five times our money at three to five times our valuations. Um, and it was tough internally to sell that to employees and feel confident about it, um, but without question, you know, wouldn't do it again. 50% of something is, is worth a lot more than 100% of nothing. Um, and so I definitely agree with the, you know, don't over-optimize for valuation. Um, and so the last two, two lessons are really about culture. So just show of hands, how many people have read a book called Tribe by Sebastian Younger? Okay, very few people. I think it's the best book about startup culture uh, that's out there, and it's not about startups or about culture, uh, but it's really a, sort of a study of, of tribes and essentially why the settlers of the United States, um, when they would get captured by Native American tribes uh, and they had a chance to escape, they would often not escape and, and sort of return back to the settler community. But the reverse almost never happened. If Native Americans were captured and they had an opportunity to escape, they'd almost always go back to the tribe. And it really studies what is it about tribes that are so unique. And, and the elements of tribes, and I think tribes are really the best definition of successful startup culture. Uh, you live in close quarters. You have a sort of shared vision. Um, you know, hierarchy is really determined by value add, uh, not sort of title or, or education. Um, and if you can create a really strong tribal culture internally, meaning one tribe, um, there's sort of two areas in which we saw tremendous value created. One was uh, in terms of competitive information. So two areas in which competitive information can come into your company is really through the tentacles of your company, which is your people. So one way is through uh, customers. Customers know your competitors' roadmaps. They know what they're working on. They know what they're beta testing. They know where their challenges are. They know where they're competitively strong and competitively weak. Um, and also when you interview with other companies or your employees interview with other companies, they tend to get tremendous information about what else is happening in the industry. Um, and so I sort of make the comment, if the greatest mistake is not creating a tribal culture uh, for your company, perhaps the second greatest mistake is not realizing when your competitor has one. Because if they have one and your employees are interviewing with them, you're losing information, you know, kind of as opposed to, to gaining information. Um, so a tribal culture can really 
uh, create an environment where this information you know, happens at the edge but comes uh, directly to the company and it added tremendous value for us. Um, the second area is really around retention, which I think um, you know, even today we're 10 years in and the majority of our first 25 employees are still with the company 10 years later. Um, and retention, particularly in the early stage, is so important because like any tribe, if one of your strongest members leaves, it's, you know, it, it impacts the survival rate uh, of the core tribe. Um, and so one example that I shared is um, you know, we had this situation where the Silicon Valley you know, hiring process kind of re-ramped up. Engineers were getting pounded every day with recruiting emails from LinkedIn. And I think, frankly, management, myself included, didn't really understand compensation had changed and opportunities had changed for individuals. Uh, and so one of the employees said, we need to change the transparency dynamic if you want to keep this sort of tribe together. And the idea was, let's create a, what they called a honeypot, which was, let's create a fake engineer, put them on LinkedIn, and every inbound recruiter email that that fake engineer gets, we're going to share in a totally transparent way to the whole company. Um, and this is with the specific purpose of getting the company to raise salaries and do things around retention, because we're at risk of losing members of the tribe. And it worked wonders. Uh, it completely changed my perspective of what was actually happening at the front lines. Uh, but it was really organically created because people valued uh, that tribal culture. It was not a top-down uh, decision. So be tribal, lesson six. Um, and lastly, I think this is probably the, the kind of the softest lesson, but um, another part of this book really talks about you know, what creates a successful tribe. And I think that at its core, it's really about the leadership of the tribe will, willing to make the, kind of the ultimate sacrifice, whatever you define that to be, uh, to make the tribe successful. So uh, to me, this is really about the founder or, or the, you know, the current executive of the company you know, the, the fundamental question is how willing are they to be last, both specifically, and that could be, you know, to get, you know, uh, the raise or to get salary back to a reasonable rate if you go through a rough patch, if that means, you know, a tough project, it means staying late, whatever it means uh, for you and your company. But it really comes down to are you as the, that leader or are you as the employee looking up the people running your company? You know, how confident are you willing that, are you willing personally, or do you believe your leadership is willing to, to sort of be last and make the ultimate sacrifice? And I don't know of any other way to essentially ensure a tribal culture being built uh, than to have leadership willing to, to make sacrifices for the betterment of the broader tribe. Um, so those are my sort of seven non-obvious lessons. Overspend, don't innovate, be an asshole. Focus on edge cases, get a low valuation, and then culturally be tribal and love being last. And I'd love any feedback on this if people have different experiences or have uh, questions about any of these lessons we learned. Thank you. Do we have about two to three questions for Todd. If you want to just come up, anyone? Yes, sir. Great. What's your best uh, filter when you're hiring to get folks who want to belong to a tribe and that will work well in a tribe? Um, that's a really good question. I think, you know, this is something that we refined over time. Um, but I would say make the hiring process as clear a demonstration of your company's culture and values and sort of tribal behaviors as you possibly can. Um, and, it, and it will really help people self-select. So, Again, this was different when we were sub kind of 50 people. When we were over a couple hundred people, you know, I would do new hire cocktails and I would ask people, what, what is the reason, and this is when we were doing well, really well hiring, what is the reason you joined the company? And I was always expecting people to say, oh, I read this article in TechCrunch or I saw one of your talks and I was really inspired or something, you know, that might reflect positively on the company. Um, and it really, over 50% of the time it was, the hiring process itself convinced me that this would be a great place for me to work. Um, and so to me, it was actually, it, there was really a double benefit. One is, is that it actually made people lean in and want to, to join our company, uh, but it was for all the right reasons, because we were very specific about making it clear in that process the things we cared about. Um, and so um, it was very hard for someone to go through our interview process and not know what it would be like to work at the company. And so that, that, ha that provides that filter, I think, that you're asking. company, so I just wanted to um, ask you one question. Sure. I mean, you have like um, pretty much experience in the video space, right? And now um, what is really taking off in is like live streaming, like live content. And I just wanted to ask you, um, what is your view on it? So what we do is like we run a live streaming platform where you can watch somebody who is 
is like developing a project, right? So right now we are doing it for programming, but next year we, we will start with design as well. Yeah. Um, so it, it's like a form of like education and collaboration. Yeah. Um, I'd like to hear like your view on it. Um, sure. Um, so I, I sort of have two thoughts. Um, one is about live video in general, which I think is a category I'm extremely bullish on. I think, I mean, it's hard to argue there's another category that has as much near-term growth potential uh, than live. So I think in aggregate, I'm very excited about live. Uh, the second piece, which is more of a just a concern that I have about everything related to the, the consumer consumption of video, and this is one of the big drivers of why we decided to to sell Brightroll, is I'm very concerned about really the aggregation of audiences in mobile in particular, um, where we have a very few number of companies that control the vast majority of sort of consumer engagement, particularly in the mobile experience. And so while I'm very bullish on live, I'm, I'm mostly bullish about live for these platforms, and I'm, I'm really sort of challenged to find ways that independent companies can extract tremendous value out of the growth of that without, in the end, being dependent on you know, kind of Facebook or other, other platforms. Um, so I'm sort of both excited and concerned about the category, uh, but it's hard to find another category I'm more excited about in video. Yep. All right, is this the last one question? More, one more, right. last question cool. coming up. Thank you. So my question is, how did you manage to persuade the best sales talent to join your vision and your team? Uh, what was the process like? So what did we do to convince great sales talent to join, join our company? That guy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe you should ask him. Let's, uh, let's have Charlie come up and answer the question. Yes. <laughs> yes, let's see. You signed the offer, so let's see. Sure, <laughs> that is a great question. The truth of the matter is, at the time, there was a very specific vision for the company. Todd had for tremendous passion for the company, for the, for the, uh, for the product, the vision. It all came together. I'd been in the media a long, long time. I was watching video kind of percolate. It just made tons of sense. And for me, I joined because I really joined for the people. And it was a ground floor opportunity. I didn't feel like there was, you know, the, everything has risk. But it was just very, very exciting to me. And I think it was, it, it, this was a little easier because it was a very obvious category that was going to be big. Speaking about, um, you know, the market size, we knew it was going to be big. Um, it was not crowded at the time, so it was an opportunity to, you know, go in and build something early, and um, it, it, that's that was the reason. It really, was a small group of people, so there weren't. I didn't have a lot to, to. Uh, but it, for me, it was an opportunity to help build something from scratch. So yeah, the only thing I would add to that, I would say, particularly the probably the first ten, maybe even twenty hires, um, the, the the whole senior leadership team was involved in the hiring of those individuals. We we likely weren't sourcing them, but uh, you know, we were definitely part of the close process, getting them excited that it wasn't just, uh, you know, sort of the same sales opportunity that they could get at a larger organization, but they were going to be involved in product iteration, and they were going to they were going to have a strong voice in the company, and that um, the company really valued sales. I mean, I used to say this all the time: my job is to make the sales team feel like we're a sales-driven company, and the product and engineering team like we're a product engineering-driven company. But I think really the best companies actually have the balance between the two. Um, but the way I could express that was by spending the time, you know, listening to the feedback, being personally engaged, and trying to, and, and you saw I was transparent about that balance, but, but did my best to actually try to deliver on it as well. Thank you. What was the name of the, uh, the fake engineer on LinkedIn? What was your honeypot engineer? I love that idea. I, mean, I have the guy's name, but not from memory, but. Yeah. It sounded like a traditional Silicon Valley engineer, but I don't remember what the name was. <laughs> right. Awesome. One more round of applause for, for Todd. Awesome.